So we start with the first case, that's indirect hyperbilirubinemia at birth. Is it all physiological? May I call upon the presenter, Dr. Smita Malhotra, our moderator, Dr. Anupam Sibal, please, and our panelists, Dr. Girish Gupte, Dr. Alka Jadav, Dr. Ujjal Podar. Thank you. Moderator will be seated here next to the presenter. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Abha, Fazil, Anita, uh, Rajesh, uh, the IAP Mumbai team, and uh, the Children's Liver Foundation for uh, this unique experiment. It's really going to be exciting. I want to compliment the team for the pains that they've taken. I think uh, your planning's been very precise. Uh, the reminders have been very prompt. And I think you've kept everybody on their toes to make sure that they review the slides and do some homework. So that, I think, is fantastic. And this, I'm sure, is going to be a very exciting one and a half day uh, CME. So we start off, uh, Smita, uh, you start off the presentation. And what I was proposing, and if everyone agrees, is that we'll not wait for the presentation to end. Because you know, as it goes along, whenever there's a question, that comes to mind. I think we'll request the, uh, you know, the participants. I'm going to throw it open to them, and we love comments. And we have a very experienced panel. We got Girish from uh, Birmingham. We got Alka from Bombay, and we got uh, Ujjal from uh, Lucknow. And then we'll we'll make this very interactive with the participants and the panelists. Really having a, a discussion on uh, what is the right approach, and uh, hopefully this should be exciting. So Smita, start off, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I shall be presenting a case of indirect hyperbilirubinemia at birth. Uh, uh, this baby came to us at 27 months of age, age from Qatar. Uh, she was a product of a consanguineous marriage. Uh, she had jaundice since day two of life. Uh, her total bilirubin was 25 milligram percent, and the indirect fraction was 23.2 milligram percent. Uh, a history of uh, jaundice from day two of life with uh, day two of life yeah, with uh, a total bilirubin of 25 indirect of 23.2 so what comes to mind sorry any any we have to be a bit audible sorry sorry physiological Sorry, not the senior people, <laughs> the postgraduates. The instructions are only for the postgraduates. No senior people. So it, it's a bit high. This is day, she, she presented. I mean, the, the history goes back on day two. So this is day two. We got a bilirubin of 25. So it's pretty high on day two. Just one thing, whoever yeah. wants to speak, please come to these standy mics and speak, you know, so that everybody can yeah. hear. Yeah. So a bit high for physiological. So there's something else going on for sure. Okay. Any any comments? Do the panelists like to comment? Some hemolysis, okay. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, this is a 27 months old. No, no, I mean, we are going back to the history. The child has now presented to us at 27 months, mm -hmm. but at this point in time, the baby is three days old in Qatar, has yeah. a bilirubin of 25, indirect is 23.2, a okay. product of a consanguineous marriage. So in that case, obviously it is going to be, there are two, three causes which are coming. It's definitely not physiological because any bilirubin up to one week of life crossing uh, level above 20 milligram, we definitely warrant an investigation. We'll have to really look into whether is it a hemolytic disease of newborn. It's, that is something That's which we really have to. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Ujjal, Girish, anything else you might want to? See, the diagnosis is clear. Since you said it is a 23 months old, no. and the ability of jaundice, the present of jaundice now, obviously this cannot be hemolytic. Otherwise, there are two differential diagnoses. At day three with high bilirubin. One is hemolytic anemia, another is quick learner. Type right. one. Grish. Type one. Yeah. I always agree with whatever Ujjal says. Ah, we all do. <laughs> because Ujjal always has the last word. Uh, okay, carry on, Smitha. Uh, to outline the approach towards indirect hyperbil, when we are faced with the situation of high indirect bilirubin, uh, we proceed, think of, as uh, Dr. Ujjal said, we think of hemolysis. And to th for that, we look for the DCT. If the DCT is positive, then it shows that there is some amount of isomerization. It could be RH disease, hemolytic disease. It could be ABO incompatibility, or it could be some minor blood group incompatibility. If the Coombs test is negative, then it could be because of 
overload which is causing increased hemolysis in conditions like delayed cord clamping, polycythemia, maternal fetal 10 to 10 transfusion. Uh, if no evidence of hemolysis is found, then we look at the hematocrit and the hemoglobin. If we have a normal RBC morphology, uh, if we have an abnormal RBC morphology and high retic count, then the possibilities would be ABO incompatibility, we would think of G6 period deficiency, we would think of thalassemias, uh, obviously beta thalassemia does not present so early, so alpha thalassemia we would think of, uh, spherocytosis, uh, other uh, membrane defects, and DIC in the setting of sepsis. If we have a normal retic count and the RBC morphology is also normal, then the causes that we would think of would be any extravascular blood. We would have to look for a kefal hematoma, any bruising, or any uh, site of occult bleeding. Oh, then I'll not be able to see this. Uh, if other possibilities would be increased enterohepatic circulation, which we can uh, encounter in cases of pyloric stenosis, uh, intestinal obstruction, or in cases of swallowed blood. In these cases, we will have indirect hyperbill prolonged for more than two to three weeks. Uh, metabolic problems and endocrine problems we have to think, Krigler Najar, uh, hypothyroid, and breast milk jaundice. So, on examination in our baby, there was no hematoma, there was no blood group incompatibility, there was no evidence of any sepsis, there was no evidence of hemolysis. We looked at the complete hemogram, at the peripheral smear, the retics did a G6PD, did the DCT, saw negative, the LFTs were normal, and the thyroid function tests were also normal. Okay, so we'd stop here. What do you think um, are we looking at? <coughs> You're looking at critical larger type 2, okay. Anyone else differs? Can I say something? Yes, Girish. Am I allowed? Of course. <laughs> so, Krigler Nair, you know, you can't, I agree with Krigler Nair, but you cannot differentiate between type 1 and type 2 at this stage. That's all I would say. So, this is most likely Krigler Nair, but you cannot differentiate type 1 and type 2 at this stage. Right. So, we'll move on. So, a possibility of Krigler Nair type 1 was considered in view of the high bilirubin levels. The child was on phototherapy, underwent multiple exchange transfusions. And a mutation analysis was, was done in Europe at four months, which gave us a definitive diagnosis. Well, not us, actually. It gave the team in Qatar the, team, the diagnosis. Qatar, yeah. Right. So, move on. The child was on home phototherapy, uh, would require <coughs> phototherapy for 16 to 18 hours a day, and the bilirubin remained between 16 to 18. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Yeah. So, how do we go about making this diagnosis? I mean, Girish said that clinically, I mean, you can't really distinguish at, at such a young age, of course. Um, fin yeah. Yeah. For this particular case, it's relatively easy. The diagnosis was confirmed based on, on the genetics. But now, how do you actually go around distinguishing or making a diagnosis of CN1 or CN2? Of course, we know that phenobarbiton will result in the decrease of jaundice when we are dealing with CN2. It won't make any difference in CN1. But how do we make a diagnosis? Anyone wants to comment? Um, the panelist, anyone in the panelist would like to comment on making a diagnosis? I think you have to wait until the age of three months, really. Until the age of three months, you will not be able to differentiate between type 1 and type 2. And that was showed in a paper in archives from our group, uh, really, uh, that you know, you'll have to wait for three months. And a genetic diagnosis would be able to establish that. By that time, you know, with phenobarbital, Krigler-Nayar type 2 should improve. And Krigler-Nayar 1 will continue with treatment, like the audience has said. Would you want to comment on, on looking at uh, the bile and the deuterium and, and you know, the, now that the genetic diagnosis is available, does that have any role at all? Having said that, getting the diagnosis confirmed in India is a challenge because, you know, this study will have to be done overseas. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would say that I would still, in the UK, I would go with the genetic diagnosis more. But in where you don't have genetic diagnosis available, you could go with the analysis of the bile in the duodenum, but there are false positives with that. So you cannot confirm the diagnosis exclusively on the basis of bile in the duodenum. Okay. So, so we all agree, everybody in the house agrees that, you know, they approached this systematically and arrived at a diagnosis. And the question is, what next? Do you want to go on, Smita? Yeah. Uh, the child was advised for a liver transplant at our hospital at around one year of age. 
and the transplant was ultimately done at 27 months. So we're going to just stop there and I'm going to pose this question. What are the treatment options when we make this diagnosis? Right, this is a very interesting condition and theoretically there are many opportunities, you know. Uh, we know that there's been some interest in gene therapy. Having said that, there's no evidence uh, of any conclusive work in that direction. You can actually do hepatocyte transplants, which are very attractive as well. Then, of course, we have transplants and what type of transplant. I mean, can, should we do a conventional transplant or should we do an auxiliary transplant and wait uh, for the potential of gene therapy? So these are the, the questions that uh, actually need to be answered. So I'm going to ask if anyone uh, here has any comments on what is the right Vinita. Uh, no, I think it's better to use a mic. Thanks very much. I, I don't think this microphone's on, is it? No, just be a bit louder, Vinita. Um, I think that um, liver transplant at one year of age is probably a bit early because phototherapy options are so much better. So we had published, and I'm sure others have as well, a, a uh, thank you, purpose-built phototherapy unit for younger children where they can sit up, they can eat their meals, they can do their homework. Uh, electricity in India notwithstanding, that is much more uh, functionally better outcome than doing a transplant at one year of age. Yep. Totally agree with you. In fact, they, they actually uh, told the family and then they needed to organize uh, the funding and they said, well, the child's going to need a transplant. Let's start talking about it. Totally agree with you. Uh, Girish, what would be the right age to do a transplant? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would again agree with Vinita that, uh, you know, transplanting at one year of age might be a little bit early. But uh, I, I think it, it really becomes difficult when the child becomes mobile and when the child's schooling starts and, and especially if you are not able to control the levels of bilirubin. So, you know, the social factors, the family factors need to be taken into consideration at the time of transplantation. So I think certainly not at one year of age, but any, any time when the child goes to the schooling age, because that's when they really struggle uh, with their quality of life and the family struggles with that quality of life, because holidays can be a problem. Absolutely right. And that's exactly what was happening.